Hi, everybody. This is Sherry Seligson, and um, I am an Apologia author, uh, wrote the Marine Biology High School curriculum, and I also wrote Internship for High School Credit and some EVD instructional videos that go with our science courses. I'm a homeschool mom of four, and we educated our children at home for, for 21 years. I'm here today to talk to you about some of the helpful hints and some ideas on how to teach high school science. And we're gonna go over some practical things, but we're also gonna go over just some, some bigger picture things as well to help give you a better, uh, just encouragement as you go through navigating this process uh, with your students. Now, I first wanna talk about why teach science in the first place. Why do we even need to learn science? And I know you, you may get that question from your students once in a while, but first of all, academic preparation kind of comes to mind first. You know, we need, if you have a student who is science directed and is, is planning on going into university, then they're gonna need at least one semester of science in college. So you need to prepare them for that. Even if they're going to be a poetry major, they're going to need at least a semester of science. So we want to prepare them for that college level course. Um, also, high school sciences look good on a transcript for anything. Whether the student is going into college or career, it shows that they've taken rigorous high school courses and they're prepared to do well. They do their best in everything and they're going the extra mile. So it looks great on the transcript and it shows that your student is a hard worker who is going above and beyond. Now, another reason is you really don't know what your student is going to do when they become an adult. You know, we have an understanding or a little bit of glimpses of their likes, and their dislikes, and some of their passions, but we really don't have the full picture of what God has for them in the future. So we want to prepare them for anything. Oh, there goes some flashes right there. Some exciting science going on in my background. Um, but anyway, we want to prepare them for the opportunity to do whatever God has for them. And so, if you don't give them a good preparation or a good foundation in the education of science, then you're automatically uh, preventing them from doing that in the future or, or making it more difficult for them to do in the future. And so we don't wanna overforce them and make them do things beyond their ability, but if they're able, then why not give them the, the good solid foundation in all of the sciences during their high school years so they will be prepared for whatever God has for them. And then, it's important to help them see all three branches of science. There's three major branches, biology, chemistry, and physics. And each one is very unique and each one is applicable to life. No matter what our children are doing, having an understanding of the basic biological processes of the body would benefit them, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine two o'clock in the morning holding our, our, our crying infant who's sick, understanding what their needs might be when they've got a fever is, is a benefit. Or going to the doctor's office and the doctor explaining to you something just to know how the body works. It helps us in our livelihood, in our life, to know how body processes work, right? And then in chemistry, there's lots of practical applications for chemistry as well. Cooking is huge. We have an understanding of acids and bases and what causes bread to rise and understanding those kinds of things. Um, household maintenance like painting and how the furnace or a gas stove or a fireplace, how those work. Understanding chemical principles help us in our livelihood, in our life. And then physics as well, just learning how to drive and the physics of driving and taking turns and driving on ice or snow. Those are principles that having an understanding of physics will benefit a student. Um, so the best reason for science, I would say though, is to get an amazing understanding of learning about the one who created our world. Why do we study science? Because we explore our world to learn more about it, to get a glimpse of the one who created it. We see his fingerprints in creation and can learn more about his character because he has made ordered design. And so to give our children that, that awe, that understanding is a wonderful thing. Now, what if parents don't like science? Um, I've heard that before and I understand we don't like every single subject that we are, we are called to teach our children, but understand that we need to try to, to find a reason for giving them this education. You know, I, I use this example um, with my family. I, I have never liked Brussels sprouts. I mean, this is kind of a little rabbit trail, but I've never liked them growing up as an adult. I have tried them every way. People said, oh, you've got to try this recipe or that recipe, smother them in garlic or bacon or whatever. I've burned them to a crisp. I've done everything. I, I like cabbage, but I just don't like Brussels sprouts. And so my children never got exposed to Brussels sprouts growing up. And one day, one of my kids came home from a friend's house. They tasted some at their house and said, why don't we ever have those? And I was like, oh, I guess I've never exposed you to that because 
I don't like them. And, and sure enough, I went ahead and bought some, which I didn't like. I didn't even like the smell of them. And I cooked them for the kids and they all love them. And so by my not liking something, I actually prevented my children from being exposed to having that opportunity to do something that they love or to enjoy something that they love. And they all love Brussels sprouts now. And it's kind of the same thing with science. I don't want to equate science and vegetables too much together, but understand that if we have this attitude of, I don't like science, I never have liked science, perhaps you had a bad instructor when you were in school, imposing that attitude on your students, they'll kind of embrace that. They're watching you, they're looking for your cues, and they're gonna follow that. And so understand that you may have, and God in his great wisdom might do this, if you don't like science, he may give you a young scientist. And what a great opportunity for us to learn along with them. So understand that that's an important part. And granted, there's tests and terminology and processes and even some math sometimes, but it's the same kind of thing with any other process or any other subject. If you enjoy writing, you have to learn the mechanics of writing. You have to diagram sentences. You have to learn sentence structure. Literature, if you're a literature person, you gotta understand themes and tropes and writing styles and, and all of those other things that go with it. And so there are terms, there are, there are uh, memorization, there's definitions, but it's to help us understand the mechanics behind the beauty of science. And so it doesn't have to be only a chore if you keep that fascination in studying our world. So I wanna talk about three major challenges in, um, that we might experience in our teaching of science, particularly in the high school years. And I'm gonna actually go back to some of the middle school years too, because that's our transition from elementary to high school. And oftentimes one of the challenges is that the transition through middle school was not there. There was no transition. So students just got thrown into a high school course and just got overwhelmed. And so we need to make sure that we try to gradually introduce a little bit more rigor into their science education from their elementary years. And so um, a lot of times uh, parents will tell me that their students uh, love science in elementary school and then they got to middle school or high school and they just lost that dislike. And that's because we just throw at them so many things, um, tests and memorization and things that, that don't seem as much fun. But if they have that purpose, if they have that understanding of the beauty of exploring God's world, then they'll understand that process. And we can walk them through it a little bit slower, a little more gradually, so that they're not slammed with so much stuff. And so um, that's something I would encourage you to do through the middle school years um, and if not, start in the high school years, and so it's not wasted time. But take a week or two first in the first part of the course to go over the new requirements, what's expected of them, what the course looks like with them, and walk through with them how to answer questions. When you get to the end of a module, what, what kind of questions are there? Where will we find those? And look for those, um, the bolded letters or the, or the definitions or, or uh, section titles to help them find that information so they can answer those comprehension questions. And then break it down for them. You know, they're looking at this looming chapter they have to get through in a certain number of days and it looks overwhelming. So help your student learn to break those up into smaller assignments by day. Now, Apologia has student notebooks to go with our courses and at the beginning of the student notebook, there's a schedule of what to do each day. So the student can look and it's broken down into smaller attainable bites that's not overwhelming for the student. Not to mention that also helps them to begin to own their education, to begin to become those self-directed learners we want them to be, to be independent. Obviously, it's a great thing as a homeschool mom to have independent learners who just take their books and go, um, but they don't just get there automatically. We want them to gradually gain those skills, and one of those is by parsing out in, uh, the, the assignments per day to break that up so that they learn how to do that for themselves and then they become self-directed. Woo, there's some lightning. Just adding some more excitement to this presentation. But they're actually wading in rather than diving in head first. Now, lab reports are also a component of science, and we want to encourage our students to do that. Lab reports help them think logically through the process of what they've done in an experiment. And many kids will say, well, I like science until I had to do a lab report. And that part of it's because it's more work, but part of it is that they're not understanding the process. And so actually, Apologia has a um, wonderful um, video that shows students how to do a lab report on our YouTube channel. So if you go to Apologia World on our YouTube channel, you will see 
the lab reports, and it's about a 10 minute video, takes them through the process. But in a nutshell, you start with your title of the experiment and the date that it was performed and why you're performing the experiment. You know, what you think the outcome will be, which is called your hypothesis. And then a list of the equipment that you used and then the method. This is what I did first, this is what we did second, this is what next happened, and this is the information that we learned after we did it. And so your next section would be the data and the observations that you made. So if you're dropping things into water to see which things float, and which things sink, you're gonna have a list or a table showing what the things were that you dropped and whether they sunk or whether they floated. Those are your results. And then you'll talk about in the conclusion section what you learned. So can you see how it's kind of a logical process taking students through the, um, the beauty of approaching studying our world in an orderly fashion, because that way we really can see what we're looking at and better understand the concept behind what we're looking at. Now, middle school students, you may want to do a lab report that's about a page long, um, no more than a page and a half to two pages. High school students, maybe a little bit more than that. And if you've got them in a co-op or a group, it's up to the teacher how much they do. But this kind of gives you a guideline of what to expect. Now, what about math? Science and math are often connected, and that can be kind of scary for students. One of the problems that students might face is that they're in a science course that requires math that they haven't mastered. And so you need to make sure that you have, uh, that they are prepared in their math skills to be able to do the science that they're in. And so um, understand that they'll be frustrated. They can't even do what's required of them. Love the blinking. That they can't do what's required of them if they can't do the math. So um, for physical science, we, we have for our courses general science, which is recommended for seventh grade, physical science recommended for eighth grade, biology for ninth, chemistry 10th, and there's more courses that go after that. But for math, the basic math is needed for physical science. And then algebra one is kind of your benchmark math. Most students are taking algebra one when they're taking general biology. And the reason is they need to complete algebra one before they can take chemistry. If you have a student who has completed biology and has not taken algebra one yet, then that's okay. We have other sciences that they can take. They could take marine biology. They could take human anatomy. And that gives them another science, a life science, that does not require the math. So they're not uh, get losing ground in an area while they're building those math skills. And then they could take chemistry once they have completed the algebra one necessary for that. And again, we want to flex what a student needs based on where they are with their skills. And that's one of the beauties of homeschooling. You can assess where they are. And sometimes you need to take a course and expand it a little bit longer. I said that general science is recommended for seventh grade. Some students might need that to go over two year period. Um, some students may start general science in eighth grade and do physical science in ninth grade. Our physical science course, if taken during a high school year, is considered a high school credit. So that helps you get through some of those issues of when to teach what. And another stumbling block is that students are sometimes just spitting back the information in science. They're just memorizing something to put it back on a test and then move on to the next thing. And they lose the excitement. They lose the awe. And we want them to understand concepts because that will make it real. That will make it tangible. You know, when your kids are on a seesaw at the playground, they're going up and down, you can help them to understand. They've explored what that does. If a heavy person's on one side and a little tiny kid's on the other side, then it's going to go up like this. And, and they understand the principle behind that because they've, they've done it. They've experienced it. But then you can start giving those uh, that's actually a lever. You can give, put terms on those things. A seesaw is a lever. And the center point that's going up and down around is called the fulcrum. And you can talk about, remember when you're on a seesaw and this is what happens? Well, here's where the fulcrum is. What happens when you push down on this side? This side goes up. And they, they have the concept. And then you're just giving names to those items that they're familiar with by exploring. And that actually is one of the reasons why you want your students to continue to do labs. I know labs can be involved. I know that sometimes our days are just so busy, but it is such an important part of science because it's hands-on. They can see it. They can touch it. They can explore what's going on. And then they mentally have that image as they're reviewing the information that they learn. So perhaps um, to make it more practical, maybe you do one day every other week, every maybe every other Tuesday is lab day, and you save all the days that you're going to do the labs and tell the student we're not going to do it until this, the second Tuesday because that's when I have scheduled for labs. That gives you a heads up to gather materials. I don't know how many times my kids came to me saying, mom, I need purple cabbage today. And I was like, well, I'm not going to the store today. I don't have it in the refrigerator. And so 
I finally learned through a lot of trial and error to just schedule that. When it was time for a lab, I would say, we're going to put that aside and do the lab a day uh, next week on that Tuesday or that Wednesday, whatever my day was. And I was prepared. And that helped us to get those labs completed. Not because we wanted to check it off a list, but we, because we want our children to see it, to understand the concepts. And so that's a very important part, to see science in motion. And then finally, sometimes students and parents just view science as a subject required for high school graduation. It's something they have to endure to get through it, to check off the boxes again, to put it on their transcript to say they did it. You know, I think science is one of the coolest ways to see our world, to see what God has done. We learn more about the Creator. And this type of thinking will amaze us. It will give us awe. It will make us excited to study what we have before us. The more I study and teach science, the more I am just blown away at the forces that hold planets into space, at, at how organisms live together in a relationship such that they can't live without each other. And that actually is a testimony for creation and against evolutionary theory. The intricacies of the human eye and, and how even though scientists are trying to re replicate that, they can't. It's so complex. I could go for hours on talking about this, just something, the simplest living organism that we know of, a bacterium, and how the complexity in one of those tiny single-celled organisms is phenomenal. It, it, it is life, I always love to say, life does not go from simple to complex, but it goes from complex to ridiculously complex. There is no simple organism. And that is testimony to our creator, the one that spoke it all into being. And then lastly, if you're still apprehensive about doing this, get help. There's a lot of helps out there for you to help your student learn. There are co-ops. Check with your state organization for homeschooling to see what kind of co-ops are in your area. There are, um, Apologia has instructional DVDs. Um, we've got, we're, we're producing more and more of these for our high school subjects, and hopefully we'll have some soon for our middle school subjects that will take you through step-by-step do the, they actually, you can video, see videos of the labs, there's animations, there's instruction for sections, and we have an online academy for students who want to have an instructor to converse with, to have other students that are in their class. And so there are lots of helps available to your student to get the information, to have the courses that they need, and to not um, make it something that is a fearful thing or something that they have to check off of the box. So I think as creationists, it's so important to know um, what our world is, what's in our world, and how God has designed our world. Because our desire is to make science an engaging, a pertinent subject for everyone. And we offer lots of options to fit your students' needs so they can gain that excitement too. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed being here, and I hope that um, if you have any questions, feel free to comment here, and I'm going to check back regularly to see if I can answer those questions. You can connect with me over at my Facebook page, which is Sherry Seligson Author, um, and I'm happy to engage with you there. But please feel free to do that because we do desire for you to feel confident and comfortable and excited about teaching your students about high school science. And it is something that will be an adventure and a wonderful opportunity to walk along with your students as they're going through those high school years. So thank you for uh, coming and joining and listening to this. And I just hope that you have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your school year as you are pouring into the hearts and the minds of your children.